All right, hello everybody. I'm going to turn off the sound here. All right. Hello everybody. We I am streaming from London, England. I am with uh, at London Real, Ryan Rose, gracious enough to give me the office to stream while I travel. So this is the advanced business call, business mentorship call that we do twice a month. And today, if you remember, if you were on the last call, we're going to be talking about the book Millionaire Next Door. So if you're new to the program and haven't had time to read uh, the book, that's fine. We're going to go over it. If you've been in the program, hopefully you've taken the time because this book is extremely good. I, as I've been rereading it, preparing for the call, um, I've read it a few times in my life. Uh, I just remember why it's such a good book. This one's good. So we're just going to jump right into it. Now, the first thing, uh, go ahead and leave some comments below. Uh, and I want to start with this. If you know that I've done these, the way I do them is I try to do as much interaction as possible. Remember, this is very key. If you've been watching my, if you're on my Twitter or Facebook, I've been talking a lot about uh, people wanting to be entertained. There's a part of your brain, the dopamine uh, reward uh, wiring in your brain is always looking to have kind of a rush. So the reason people watch sports or they like a comedian's jokes or they like looking at a pretty girl or whatever it might be is because it releases, and it's another reason people like shopping, by the way, uh, it releases this dopamine and other chemicals in our brain that make us feel reward. But remember, those things, if you're not careful, just turn you into a spectator. The average person, US, is watching three hours of TV a day. Um, and they and now with the internet, it's just being swapped out from TV to YouTube videos or funny videos. And it's, you don't want to become somebody addicted to that dopamine rush. So the reason that we're going to stop as we go through this and ask, I'm going to ask you to literally write comments below is to break out of that cycle. You know, I remember going to conferences sometimes and thinking it's cheesy when they're like, hey, everybody comment. And I realized... Even if it is cheesy, the upside is not getting trained to be a slave to this dopamine response. So as we go through this book, I'm not doing this to give you insight. Now, you will get insight, just like when I read that book, uh, I get insight. But I, you should never read a book for the insight. Why? Well, as I've talked about over and over, my favorite thing about the Dalai Lama, hearing... You're on this call, you've kind of risen above someone who's just a pure spectator. I get that. But comprehending, this is the insight, gaining the insight, that's right there. Nobody lives the good life because they have a lot of insight. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's not. It's not. It's actually the most common sense uh, train of thought that you could come to, the most logical train of thought. It's only by instincts changing. So this call, just some of you have heard this before, but again, some people say, Ty, sometimes I hear you repeating yourself. I repeat myself on purpose. I repeat myself because the human brain learns through repetition. You learn English when you're one years old to make it an instinctual part of your cognitive functions language by repetitively hearing the word dog, mom, food. You don't learn it one time. So I like, you know, it's always funny whenever someone says that to me, it says, Ty, this one guy commented, Ty, all I hear you, and he listed all these buzzwords that I use. All I hear you is talking about doubling down and investing in yourself and, you know, <clears throat> uh, better, better late than never and make haste slowly and, uh, to get what you want, you have to deserve what you want. And he just listed all these kind of 40 quotes that I had. And I wrote them back and I said, see, it works. Or it's beginning to work on your brain. Because the first, he was now here. He was moving from here to here. The second you memorize stuff, things that you memorize become more instinctual. It's obviously not an automatic response, but there's definitely something to that. So as we go through this, 
and right now, stop, I'm gonna set the timer, I like to discipline myself, one minute, what is the biggest thing that you got from this book, okay? So I'm marking it down, one minute. If you haven't read the book, okay, comment below, what's the biggest thing you could learn from one of the largest surveys on self-made millionaires in the world? Just a gut feeling or a question, all right? So write that below. Scroll down there, Zach, so I can see what people are saying. Sometimes you have to refresh it. Which one? Go up then. For some reason that one's been locked in. It's not, it's just here. It's not what's going out. Hmm. But when I refreshed it, it went back to it. When you've gotten it, that was Do you get the comments or not? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Then that's fine. You know you're here. Okay. So, I see some comments. They're frugal, paying less taxes through unrealized income. Yes, great point. They budget. Uh, what are their main habits? Sorry, can you pull it a little closer to me? The whole setup will it come? <clears throat> yeah, budgeting, haven't read, live below your means, up a little bit there, go to the top. Okay, someone said learning that millionaires aren't necessarily that special. All good insight. We're gonna go through everything that I learned and everything that I jotted down in my notes. Someone said building, what did they say? Go down a little bit then. Building wealth, takes discipline, sacrifice, hard work, budgeting, and investing our skills. Yeah, that I don't know much about. Thank you for being honest. All right, so here's the first note. A lot of fascinating things. This one, by the way, is almost the best one. So I'm gonna. I save the best for first. I'll read you a direct quote. <clears throat> when I travel, you'll notice I do most of my notes uh, online on my phone. As a group, millionaires in this study only realize 7% of their net worth as income. So what that means is somebody whose net worth was one million, okay, was trying, and I don't know if this was conscious or unconscious, trying to only receive an income in form of a salary or dividends of 70,000. That's 7% 7 of a million. So then they'd have to pay legally, right? You don't wanna do anything illegal with the tax man. Uh, but what these millionaires do is they only, if they've got a business that has, well, let me not put the currency, we have people around the world here. Uh, if you're making a million, uh, I'm sorry, if your net worth of your business is a million and your personal net worth, successful people were only pulling out 70,000 a year. So if you're in a 30% tax bracket, that'd be about 21,000 a year in taxes, but they had unrealized gain of 1 million. That's fascinating. I, I know obviously that Alan Nation, one of my first mentors, that was his big rule of thumb be careful how much income you realize. Now, interestingly enough, by contrast, the average high income household, so do he specifically talks about doctors, attorneys, they're almost the inverse. If they've got a net worth of, let's say, 300,000, so this is where you wanna be, according to this book, closer to the set. Obviously, it's not set in stone, it has to be 7%, but the average high income person is at realizing 90%. So if their net worth is 300,000, they're paying themselves a salary of 270,000. Look at how insidious this cycle is. You're paying yourself 270,000. You're probably even in a higher tax bracket. Let's just say that bumps you up to a 40% tax bracket. You're paying, I don't know, roughly 110,000 in taxes even though you only have a third of the net worth. 
It's not how much you have, it's how much you keep. Remember that number. Now, for those of you who have never done this, let's do a little exercise here. I'm not going to make you po publish this post uh, publicly, but what is your net worth? Okay. Now, some of you I'm going to insult by doing this because you already know how to calculate it, but who cares? Do it again. Never be afraid of the fundamentals. So right here, net worth equals all assets at full value. I don't care if you have them on loan or not. So if you have a house worth a million, what's the full value, FV, of the asset? minus the full value of all debt, okay? That's your NW, your net worth. So if you own a house, it's a million value, you've got, I don't know, cars worth 50, you've got cash worth 50, you've got a business. How should you value your business? A good rule of thumb, doesn't always apply, just do one times your gross earnings. So if the gross earnings of your business is 300,000, 500, let's say 300,000, just value your business at 300,000. Now remember, if you only own half the business, you would only owe 150. Okay? Let's assume you own 100%. So one times So this is a very sloppy but somewhat accurate. If that's you, you'd have 1.4 million gross asset value. Okay? Subtracting the full value of your debt, so let's say you have a note in cars and house of 500,000. Again, it, most of you know this, you'd have a 900,000 net worth. If we want to use this litmus test, and this is something even those of you who are more advanced might not do, how much did you report as taxable income, the income that you lived on? So let's say you, you paid yourself in taxable income, 200,000, then you just do the ratio there. So at that, you're like roughly for uh, 25%. You could say it's a, it's, we'll just round here. So you'd see that at 25% realized income, uh, you're about triple, sorry, the average millionaire. So in this survey. So you would want to go, how can I either, if you need 200 grand then, you could also try to push up your net worth. Don't forget that. Or you could live more frugally. Or you could try to have a business that allows you to tax deduct some of the things that you're doing now. That's a little trickier. All right, so everybody, again, this is not entertainment. If you need entertainment, Go watch my YouTube videos. I just put out that Lamborghini series. I bought a Lamborghini and I've been filming fun little entertaining things. Those are free. Those are for the masses. Those are to get people excited about education. You're in this program not because you care about entertainment, right? So I want you to tell me, without revealing your net worth, I'm not going to ask you to do that, but you can. There's nothing wrong with revealing it, you know, for some people. Some people are more private. What's your percentage? Put the number here. They're going to take you a minute. I'm going to give two minutes for everybody to calculate this. So all you do, calculate your net worth here, gross value after assets, I mean after debt subtracted. Then on this side of the ratio here, put your how much taxable income you reported last year and then divide them and you will get the percentage. All right, I'm gonna set this for two minutes, pull out the cap. By the way, people ask me what apps I keep on my phone. I will tell you the most important one. It's the one that comes free, calculator. People go, why calculator? That's too simple. Humans speak the language of their country, English. Here in London, they speak the Queen's English. Wherever you are in the world, you speak a language. The good thing about making money and wealth is that's your language right there. If you don't speak the language of a calculator, I highly recommend you make that on the top row. That's on the, my apps, uh, it's in the, almost the most prominent place. I use the calculator every day. Don't tell me you're not a money person. When someone said, I mean a number person. Someone tells me they're not a number person, I said, yeah, you're also not a wealth person. There's nobody 
that has real wealth that can't pull out a calculator every once in a while. So pull out the calculator. I'm setting it for two minutes. Let's go through this exercise. Knock it out. By the way, I hope a lot of you are coming to this seminar January 30th. Buy a ticket. It, I'm bringing Joel Salatin. In 21 years, I've never done a joint event with, uh, this is my new, it's in Hollywood at the Roosevelt Hotel. This month, Friday, January 30th, Saturday, January 31st, from one o'clock, uh, from 12 noon, sorry, till uh, about seven or eight at night. Two days, in person. All right, so go back to this. Taxable income, net worth. Get those two numbers, divide them, and get the percentage. And then just post the percentage right here. Okay, I'm back. Scary to do, right? But every time I read a book, you know, it's funny. <clears throat> Even though I read books more than I think most people, I don't know. I haven't met everybody on the planet. But uh, every time I read books, I'm like, man, I should read more books. This is insight that can create instinctual change in you. Remember what Descartes said? in the 67 steps, one of them, Descartes, he said, numbers don't lie. So I'm gonna read what people are putting here. You can see, one person said, I'm unemployed. Well, unemployed is uh, the worst of all scenarios, unless it's a temporary measure, because you're not even on the chart. You're an NA, you're not applicable. You don't wanna be not applicable when you're talking about the wealth conversation. One of the things Joel Salatin told me, it's wealth wisdom, he said, Ty, one of the first business uh, goals for every human, self-employed or not, is to become fully employed. And it's harder than you think to be able to spend eight hours a day doing something that actually brings you returns. Somebody put 100%. That's not good, uh, obviously. So that's good, though. Recognize the problem first. 50%. Someone said, I have no assets. Okay. Someone said 6%. Pat yourself on the back. 10%. Uh, go down a little bit. I'm on the 10% one. Someone said negative. Yeah, that's, I mean, technically you could be negative here if you're below, but you see the point here. I saw some of you, even the most sophisticated people in here. One person said in the thirties. Okay. Very, what is that? Oh yeah. Patrick talks about a good financial calculator. Yeah, there's some good ones. So, insight, 
not important, instinct changes. What do you do from here? You have two choices, everybody. I'll show you my personal favorite. Uh, it's a little tricky to do. I'm a big believer in, woo. There we go. We good? Let me actually come, let me bring this a little closer. So I'm actually a believer, whenever you have a ratio like this, you know, you get your net worth and you have your taxable income here. Uh, I believe that the answer for most of you, unless you're very old watching this, some of you are older, if you're in your 50s, 60s, or 70s even, this will be different, but I would tend to try to push up my net worth. That's just my personal way. A lot of the people in this book uh, would try to push down those taxable income. What I think is the ideal is to hold the taxable income constant and push up your net worth. That's what this whole business program is about. You got to push up your net worth, okay? But just understand, for those of you who are older, maybe more conservative, uh, you may want to focus on cutting costs. Cutting costs isn't always as fun, but it is necessity. But sometimes what I'm saying is you can't always cut costs. You're going to have fixed costs. So just the other problem is a lot of people, they'll raise their net worth but go up. So this is my strategy is a twofold one. Hold here and increase here. So if your ratio is 20%, if you double your net worth now, it, if you hold your income, I mean, you hold your expenditures or your taxable income even, now it drops to 10%. So uh, let me do my ratio in my head real fast. I mean, mine's under 7%. I keep the ratio pretty, pretty low. Um, so, but there's been times when I haven't, and that's a trap. All right, next. If you only get one thing from this call in that book, remember, if you know this, what I just talked about, I'm telling you, you're in the top 1%, no, one millionth of 1% of the human population. Smartest people in the world I've been around financial. They don't know their ratio. So once a year, or even more often, calculate that ratio. All right, next. This one's... Interesting, one more formula. I'm gonna throw two formulas. We got the percentage formula. Next formula is the index, the wealth accumulation index. Bad handwriting here. Index, okay. Take your age, okay? So let's say you are, uh, I don't know, 40 years old. Multiply it by your taxable income. Let's say you made $100,000. Okay? Then divide it by 10. Age. So everybody, I hope you have a calculator and a paper with you today. Income. Multiply them. This is your wealth index according to this book. 40 times 100,000 is what? 4 million. Right? Divided by 10 leaves you with what? I made it pretty easy on everybody. Four hundred thousand. So what this so if that's you and you're at four hundred thousand, he says. A successful, what you want, a wealth index, is that your net worth is double that. Now, I might lose some of you, but you know, those of you who feel lost right now in math, this is why I'm doing it. No one's going to come through. You guys have all committed to come through a program that has my name on it. I guard my reputation valuable. If you come through this whole program, some of you 18 months, some of you less, uh, I don't want you saying you've come through my program and you can't do math. So you're going to have to put on 
you're going to have to become a little stoic and learn something you're not good at. I'm going to do the math one more time for you. Your wealth index, you want it to be double. So let's see. Because the average person who's not wealthy, uh, their number is equal and poor people is half. So let's do it one more time. If you are 50 years old and you make 50,000, uh, let's say you make, sorry, 200,000 a year in income. Income, not your net worth. This is your income. 50 times 200,000 is how much? 10 million, right? Divided by 10. Notice what's cool about this one. This one is age adjusted because if you're watching this in your 18, you need to have built a different net worth than your 50. If you're 18, you have more years to catch up. Maybe, although that's kind of a fallacy because you don't know how long you're gonna live, but we'll, we'll go with it. So this is one million is the number you come up with here. So be doing that. Pull out the calculator right now. What's your age? What's your income? Multiply them, divided by 10. If this is too hard for you, you are never going to be wealthy. I can tell you that. Okay? And I don't mean that condescendingly. I mean it as a wake-up call. Remember Richard Branson? He was dyslexic. And at 15 or 16, he realized he could either excuse himself and say, Oh, I can't do math. I'm dyslexic. Or he could be a billionaire. And I think he made the right choice. It, it was a little harder for him to learn. I get it. So, if you're index here is 1 million, that means your net worth should be 2 million. You want it to be double. So is your net worth 2 million? If your net worth is 1 million, that means you're doing average accumulation. If it's half, 500,000, you are behind the eight ball. So we're going to do two minutes here. I want everybody to put their factor in. Are you two times? Are you one times? Or are you half a time, or which of these are you the closest to? All right, I'm setting the timer here to two minutes. Take the two minutes, please. Very important. All right, here we are. I'm reading the comments. I see a 2.4. Awesome. I see a 0.1. Not as awesome. I see a 1.26. I see a 1 to 1. I see a half, a 1 third, a double, a half, a close to 1. So, guys, instinctual change happening today, not because of me, because of you. What's the instinct that should be changing in you? 
Remember my goal, I want to graduate 300 people at a time that come through this business program that are wealth machines. That's the goal. I don't mean that in get rich quick machines. Wealth has nothing to do. And so, what's the instinctual change that should be happening right now? If you notice, both of the calculations we dis just did ha are related to two factors, taxable income and net worth, okay? You either, and my preferred way is hold income where it is now. Sometimes you can cut. Obviously, most of you aren't absolute you know, morons with your money or you wouldn't have been able to afford to be in this program. That's why I don't do this program for free because I don't want to hold people back by having to listen to very beginners. So hold income where it is, okay? Live on what you're making now, but jack up the net worth through the roof. It's the simplest way. Now, today we won't talk totally how to do that, but I will, actually we're gonna to get to that. All right, I'm gonna keep moving through the book, guys. By the way, if you haven't read the book or you did not follow the assignment, this is like university. I'm not gonna come follow after you. I hope you guys do do the calls with Mark and, and James, people on my team, uh, that you kinda do accountability calls. Soon we're gonna, and by the way, I hope everybody's in the pri Facebook group, the mini MBA group, and we're gonna be adding one very shortly on the site, kind of accountability groups. I want change, I don't want entertainment. Next thing, what do we learn from this book? <clears throat> Next note that I have here, oops. This book has so much, it's amazingly good. All right, this is a fascinating chapter. I loved this chapter. Uh, it's actually spread over a few channels, uh, chapters. So, mindset of wealthy people. The amount of time spent each month on financial planning is directly proportional to the accumulation of wealth. So I want one more thing. You can just comment while I'm talking. I'm not gonna take two minutes. Honestly, in the and I know we have some financial planners on the call, that's great. Direct, so wealth represented as W, directly proportional to time focused is my, word on money planning. So I want you to write here below how many hours, and this is how I like to do this because people, when we look back, we get delusional. How many hours did you spend in the last 24 hours thinking about your financial planning? In the last 24, don't tell me about the last week. Tell me about the last 24 hours. If this is true, that wealth is directly related, let's just assume it's a causation, not correlation. To time, you could argue it's correlated. Never, when you ever get into somebody who thinks they're smart because they say causation for correlation, just remind them of something even smarter, which is some physicists say you can never prove causation. So anybody who tries to one-up you by being like, well, it's not because it's just correlated. Well, they might be right, but they also should remember, we can never know for sure what causes anything. So we just go with our best guess. This is the best guess. How many hours or minutes? Here's what I'm defining this. I'm not talking about dreaming about how much money you make. I'm talking about talking to your accountant, talking to your lawyer, talking to your financial planner, reading a book that's genuinely about finance. I'm not talking just about the, you know, the rich dad, poor dad, or some blog you read. I'm talking hardcore learning about money. How many hours? Anybody here in the last 24 hours spent more than one hour? Let's see, someone put zero, two hours, about an hour, 15 minutes, zero. By the way, someone said, would you really count your house as an asset even though it's not for business? Absolutely. It's an illiquid asset oftentimes, depending on the market. Okay. So some of you doing well. 
So here, what books can you start reading? The ones that I like the most are the CFP textbooks. Now for some of you, you're gonna get into those books and you're gonna be like, that stands by the way for a certified financial planner. You can go on their website. You don't need to become a certified financial planner. I became one because I was in that industry, but you don't have to become one. You don't need the piece of paper credential. Those textbooks, uh, other sources, there's a good guy, his name's ManQ, right here. One of the most uh, respected economists. Buy the textbooks. I buy textbooks all the time. Textbooks are not for universities. They're for instinctual change. Buy this guy's textbook, ManQ. That's how you pronounce his name, okay? And just read it when you brush your teeth. I call this the brush your teeth factor. I learned this from my buddy. I've told this story before. He was at my house. We're business partner. In fact, I was just talking to him yesterday. One of the most successful entrepreneurs I know. He creates serious wealth. We're talking two million bucks a month net. That he, that's his income. And he's like 34. And uh, he was at my house. We're playing basketball. He said to me, Ty. No, I asked him. I said, we need to do a... Uh, something for the accountants for the books and he said I said what do you and I asked him a question I can't remember what I asked him I was like should we be cash versus accrual and he goes I don't know what that means and I could tell he's embarrassed and he's a smart guy he doesn't like to be embarrassed he actually has a degree in like astrophysics or something so I didn't I dropped the subject three months later he was back we were playing basketball again I said man I really got to know the answer to this question and he knew everything about finances and accounting I said how'd you do it he said Oh, on the flight home, I ordered three textbooks. I took the notes from reading those textbooks. I put them on flashcards. And every day when I'm reading, I'm brushing my teeth 15 minutes a day, or I'm sorry, five minutes a day. 15 minutes would be a long time to brush your teeth. Uh, five minutes a day for three months. See, he was creating the instinctual change. What most people do is they try to sit down one time and just read a whole bunch of finance books. You're going to feel overwhelmed. It's better to do instinctual change. There's a good book I'm reading called Hooked. And they say it's better to do micro actions. So it's better to read this book every day for two minutes than read it one day for an hour and then drop it for a couple weeks. So you got to do this. This is what this book found. Now, what else did they find? As a general rule of thumb, successful wealth accumulators spend twice the number of hours per month on financial planning. Two times. So <clears throat> the average person, that's not a very hard, high, uh, high bar to beat. Because I'd say the average person spends one minute a lifetime on financially. If you spend two minutes in your lifetime, you'll be doing all right. But successful wealth accumulators allocate their time to seeking high quality investment and professional advisors. And they attend investment planning seminars. So books, okay, giving you practical stuff. By the next call, make sure you're doing this, please. YouTube, man, I, I have been going through and just spending five minutes a day looking at some Warren Buffett, some George Soros, some Branson, some, but specifically when they talk at finance schools, um, that's easy to do. You can do it while you're running. You can, number three, Conferences, that's what this book, actually going to seminars. So like I said, I, got the, I have this seminar at the end of the month. You should come to this one. You should come to lots of ones. I think, I'll tell you one other cool thing about going. So I do online seminars. Some of you have been on them. We do these live calls. My friend who makes about the most money and who's built a billion dollar company, he, he drives down, he's up in San, San Francisco, he drives down now about once every month or every two months to LA. And I said, why do you do that? Because it's a high opportunity cost. He has a 500 employee office, or sorry, 250. He has about five, 600 employees globally. But I said, you know, you're away from employees. He says, yes, Todd, being in a new physical location causes new innovation to happen in my mind and I solve problems that I haven't been able to normally solve. So books stimulate a certain part of your brain. Video, whether it be YouTube or these videos, make sure you watch the old videos that are posted. You get access to the vault by being a member here. 
and then in-person conferences. And it's interesting, this book uh, confirms that. Now, I got, let's go to the next stage. So, quick thing, how many hours have you spent in the last 30 days, okay, I'm gonna use 30 days now, hours in the last 30 days on these three things? Just guesstimate, all right? I wanna know, I'm gonna, t I'm gonna put mine in. Uh, this is my weakest. This is my strongest. But this one, I've always loved conferences. I, I, at one point in my life, I was like, man, I could just go from conference to conference to conference. Now I have too many responsibilities, but if you're younger, man, you can just be a conference junkie. Now, be careful that you don't become a dopamine fiend and never have time to become instinctually, uh, to become someone who instinctually changes, but don't take this too extreme, but you can certainly go to a conference a month and use that time. If you go back and listen to one of the vault uh, talks that I did was on the business meditation, meaning taking a vacation away from at least, I say, 100 miles from your home. Uh, that's what Bill Gates does. All right, so enough on that. Oh, sorry, let me see the answers. How many hours on textbooks or high-level books on finance? YouTube videos, conferences. So conferences will give you a big boost in hours. Anybody have 10 hours? Someone said four, okay. That averages one a week. Uh, two hours. Someone brought up Khan Academy website for free math training. Sure, experiment with it. Up there, okay. So you could see somebody saying four hours, two hours. Remember, this is directly, the reason we're doing this is not to say that it's cool, we're doing this because it creates that. What everybody in the world wants, you can have. Somebody put two hours. But I would say this definitely, if we're talking a 30 day, well, if you do 30 minutes a day times 30 days, right? That's 900 minutes, which is about what? Uh, 15 hours? So that's 15 hours. So I would say everybody here, now here's something cool. 15 hours, you can get a solid eight hours of those from conferences in one day. So sometimes in that book Steven Johnson talks about where good ideas come from, do a compressed thing. That's why I like conferences because ideas bounce around and there's actually good math. Uh, they, it's, um, I wish I could remember the name right now. It's an inverse proportion and it's basically an innovation index. Uh, and what happens is if you are in a city that has 10 times more people, the amount of innovation is not 10 times more than a small town. It's 50 times more. That's called synergies, that's exponential returns. So conferences give you that by compacting ideas and people who are of like mind. That's why I'm starting this mentor conference series. So I'm gonna try to do these about six times a year. But this one is gonna be a good one. Get your ticket. We just, by the way, on the site, you should see a conference link up there. It's very inexpensive to come. It's, I should charge more. I'm bringing Joel Salvatin, I'm telling you. This guy will change your life. There, I've met, I've been with two guys that are about billionaires this, this time while I'm in London. Joel Salvatin's at a whole nother level than people. So he's my first mentor, 18 years old. Next. Here's something I thought fascinating. It's not vodka Zach wanted me to tell you. It's blue water. I know, it does look like I'm drinking alcohol. I don't like alcohol too much, so. I have my flaws. Fortunately, alcohol isn't one of them. Uh, okay, let's talk about the mind now. How many people here worry a lot? about finances. Interesting, this book said there was an inverse worry factor. People who worry a lot are almost always more poor according to the results. It says <clears throat> only the people who actually take proactive action. So next time you're up and it's 
one in the a.m. and you're stressed over your business or you're stressed over your finances, say to yourself, this takes discipline. I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to set your alarm for 5 in the morning. And then at 5 in the morning, hit the books, sign up for the conferences, go into the business, make change. Focus on only action. Don't worry without action. But I do. I will counsel you in my experience. You can use worry as a harnessing. It's kind of like being chased by a pit bull. Where you get messed up by the pit bull is when you stop running because then the pit bull kills you. A pit bull running behind you would make you a very persistent sprinter. But when you stop, that pit bull will rip you up. So make sure the worry is the pit bull. You're here. You're running. Make sure you... That's my dog. It's the worst dog ever drawn, but make sure that pit bull is driving you forward massively. Uh, this is interesting. Formal education is inversely proportional to accumulation of wealth. Significantly larger number of underachievers have advanced university degrees. Now, you might think there's many reasons, but they bring up interesting insight. It's a reflection of society's expectation. Successful doctors, lawyers, and other professionals who have gone through formal education need a, uh, feel a need to live high consumption lifestyles. So for a lot of you, you're not, even if you've done formal school, you've now dropped out of that rat race, you don't have to have conspicuous consumption. Remember, even though I have a Lamborghini and fancy cars, I went the last two years with no car. Okay? So... This is interesting. A doctor on average earns four times the income of the average household. I know we have some doctors in here. Yet they have the lowest. Doctors spend, I mean, earn four times, but they also, of course, spend, and they have one of the lowest indexes. And my experience with doctors, they're almost always poor. I don't, even if they make a million bucks, they get scammed a lot. And I think, and the reason I brought this up is the second you think your true net worth will be from that, that's form. Formality, formal education. Joel used to always tell me, Ty, it's function over form. So the second you rock back on your heels and you rest on what you've done in the past, and that for some of you, you're resting on past accomplishments. No one cares about the past. It's like in Napoleon Dynamite where the brother is always talking about, what does he say, Zach? Uncle Rico. Uncle Rico. He always says, back in high school, I can throw, I could have thrown a football, you know, I could have thrown a touchdown. Nobody cares about what you did in high school. So doctors, and, and there's, I'm not trying to pick on doctors, but this book brings it up. When you're looking back to, oh, I went to Harvard, nobody cares. Really. Nobody cares. Maybe your patients do, but your bank doesn't. Your bank doesn't go, oh, you have, you have an MBA from Harvard? We're just going to throw, we're going to bonus 50000 into your account just to boost your net worth. Nobody cares. And it'll always be that way. I'm not knocking all formal education, but I'm saying, don't get confused. This is a hammer. Building a high net worth is not a nail. It's a screw. You need a different tool. We're talking about those tools. All right, keep going here. Uh... <clears throat> Okay, predetermined budgets, budgets, predetermined. You know, one thing I've learned in life, and I wish I had learned this, I always think I know this, but I never quite do. When somebody with gray hair, who's made a lot of money, tells you something, and you deep down, you, of course, usually you're respectful, and you're like, ah, and you deep down go, ah, that guy's wrong. Check yourself, because you're probably headed for a nightmare. And I remember one of the businesses, one of my business partners, who, believe it or not, is the wealthiest of all the business partners I have, he was like, we should do more budgeting. And I was thinking, oh, why? We're starting the business. It's too hard to predict. Pro formers don't. Even. And now I look back, and I was like, you know what? It would have been better to make a budget that was crappy, and we had to revise all the time than to have no budget at all. And that's where I learned. When a 70-year-old billionaire tells you something, do not be like me and be like, oh, I know more. One thing I always tell my staff, deep down, everybody thinks they're smarter than you. 
Trust me. If Stephen Hawking comes out and says something that doesn't align with somebody's religion or politics, people's gut feeling will be like, ah, oh, that guy didn't know who he's talking about. Doesn't matter that he has the highest IQ in the world, maybe, or one of the highest IQs. Now, people instantly, especially if it's something they have a strong belief in. So budgeting, no matter where you are, you got to get better at this, okay? You must become better. And I'm going to make, I'm going to show you how to do the simplest budget ever. It's called the budget in your head. And this is what I do. I've never heard this spoken anywhere else. So this is something, there's a lot of this stuff that I talk about. Uh, some of it you'll hear other places, but a lot of this stuff is unique to this program. I call it the daily battle. And this has done, it's funny, I just bought a few businesses this year and some of them had business partners and I introduced this to them this year and they're like, wow, this changed my life. So I don't know how I came up with it. I think it was just logic, not, that, not anything super profound, but figure out what your monthly costs are. So let's say they're, I don't know, 20 grand counting your business and just divide it by 30. So 700 roughly a day. Then figure out your monthly income. So let's say your income is, I don't know, 18,000 divided by 30, 600. And don't think about the month, think about the day. If you win every battle every day, you'll win the overall battle. So what I do is, if I go a couple days and in my head I realize I lost the battle, I freak out and make big changes or the appropriate change. So know your number. This is the best budget. There's many other budgets you can do and you should do. Start with this one. So I want everybody right now, I'm gonna set the timer for one minute. What is your daily battle that you must win in terms of your daily costs. Just take your monthly costs, divide it by 30. Put it in below here. What is everybody's? Daily, I'm gonna set the timer for one minute. I'm not asking you to put your income in. Put your expenses. Remember, this is a private group. It's not active to, for everybody to see, just people in the program. So I'm gonna set this for one minute. I'm going to mute this while you guys do that, so I won't disturb you. Okay, what's your number? All right, 1100 a day. <laughs> Put your, some people's is very low, that's awesome. I know some of you, when you're just starting out a business, they're low. Good. Somebody put $4 a day in personal cost. Where are you living? I want to move there. That's a good life. I had a brother that was living in Hollywood on 10 bucks a day. No, 15. 15 a day. Okay, so for people putting in 1100, someone put in 700 a day. Okay, if you're putting in 1100 a day, I don't care where you are. Don't 
lose many daily battles, okay? All right, let's keep moving. I see somebody. 200. Yeah, so someone has 6,000 a month, someone has 30,000. Good, okay. Someone put 1,700, cool. Good, 1,700 in and 27, I'm sorry, uh, 1,700 out and 2,700 in. That's a good number. That's what you want a day. But watch it, make sure you update it because sometimes you, you'll just, you gotta update that almost monthly, okay. Uh, this is one thing cognitive biases. Underachievers tend to worry about different issues than wealth accumulators. So everybody has worry. I thought this, this is called, by the way, misweighting bias. Okay, so if you're poor, the type of worry you have is about things out of your control. This is a little bit like Stephen Covey. If you are rich, you tend to worry about things you can control. Every poor friend that I have, I have a friend obsessed with telling me about the conspiracies at the Federal Reserve, obsessed with the conspiracies of the banking Wall Street. Just think about Occupy Wall Street. Now, I'm not saying that cause is right or wrong. I'm just saying, if you want to be poor, according to this book, try to fix something that is out of your control. Now, some of you, you might argue, well, it's democracy, the more people who vote, and there's some truth to that. I, I'm obviously overgeneralizing. Do the stuff that's in your control first. So when someone, for example, this guy that I know was telling me, can I get a job? He is poor. Uh, because he's made money before, but right now can't do it. And he started telling me about, he had a very complex political theory about what had happened. I could tell this guy had put massive amount of books, knowledge, read a lot of weird blogs, telling me about everything went downhill from the gold standard and all this stuff. Okay, he can't control any of those because half of what he was lamenting happened in the 1930s. You definitely... You might be able to occupy Wall Street now, but you can't occupy 1929 Wall Street. So this guy was just, he thought he was so smart. And I was like, you're just getting poor. And I said, how many jobs have you applied for? He said, one. I was like, well, why don't you take all this glycogen and put it in this glycogen, which you can control. Of course, he didn't listen and he's still poor. So don't be that person. Massive glycogen on what you can control. Very little glycogen should be on recessions, bubbles. Very little should be on gold, by the way. Very little should be on hedge funds. Very little should be on your stock portfolio. I'm not saying none when it comes to your stock portfolio. No one's wealthy from their stock portfolio, just so you guys know, nobody. Nobody, look at the Forbes list. No one makes money on things outside of their control. You might grow your wealth above inflation, but if you get 8% in the stock market, which if you do Monte Carlo simulations, which actually give you the real returns in a volatile market, most people never beat eight. So if you, I had a long uh, talk. I was coaching Ben Greenfield yesterday. You might know him, he has a pretty popular best-selling book and um, he, he puts on his podcast the recording of me giving him coaching every month. And he read this, I think it was Tony Robbins' book, which was giving all this insight into the stock market and how to invest your money. And I said, well, don't forget one thing. Tony Robbins isn't rich from his 401k. If you get 8% in the market, I don't care what you do, there's fees. So let's say you lose 1%. You're pretty good, you're in Vanguard and stuff. They're still losing. Trust me, there's fees they don't have to disclose that are happening behind the scenes. So you're left with 7%, inflation's at three, now you're at 4%. Depending on if this is a tax, uh, a tax advantage account, you're paying taxes, you lose a couple. There's, you're making 2% real wealth accumulation. That means following the rule of 72, every 36 years you're doubling your money. So that's great, but if any of you are 30 years old, and you're investing a thousand here, 
in 36 years, you'll have $2,000. And that's okay if you don't mind being the richest man in the graveyard. Uh, it's not my preference. I don't know that I'm going to make it another 36 years. No one does. We, as Seneca says, in our desire, in our fears, we act as if we're mortal. In our desires, we act as if, our Im as if we're immortal. Yeah, Ty, I'm going to accumulate wealth in 30 years. Well, look, you should live frugally enough that if you live 30 years, you have money left over. But don't get confused in your head that money because the stock market is not in your control. No. People that don't have your DNA or aren't close enough to you physically, I have a rule of thumb. All wealth is created by face-to-face -face interaction. So Warren Buffett goes in and buy, and he meets with the board of Coca-Cola and Dairy Queen and Gillette. Donald Trump isn't some guy investing in REIT, real estate funds. He goes face-to-face -face and cuts deals and tries to find, you know, value, underpriced value. The only, you only make wealth face-to-face. Uh, Zuckerberg, he started his own business face-to-face -face with his right-hand man, his, his board, Steve Jobs. This is the only way wealth is created. And here's why. Going back to DNA here, guys. DNA works like this. And this trumps everything you've ever read. And anybody who tries to argue with this, I would be like, you know, arguing with physics and biology is a bitch. You usually are wrong. So here's you. 100% DNA. Here's your mom and dad. 50% DNA. So guess what? Your mom does not care about you as much as she may care about the, accumul the sum of her children. So let's say you have three siblings. Your siblings have 25% of your genes. If your, your mom may make a decision that benefits her three siblings more over your happiness. So even your own mom, now obviously I'm not saying you shouldn't respect your mom. I'm not saying that, I'm saying biology guys, you're either a sucker in life or you look life straight in the eyes and go, my customer over here, now customers you see face to face. Whenever you see face to face, you might have a loyal customer that you've helped a lot, you've added value, you've been customers for years, they have a low likelihood of screwing you over because even though they don't have your physical DNA, Steven Pinker talks about something called uh, mental DNA it, or social me DNA, he calls it memes instead of genes. So you might have a, a friend, a best friend, who really almost carries 60% of your social genes who's more allied to you than your mom and dad. And if you don't believe me, moms and dads do all kinds of bad stuff to their kids. So do brothers. Read history. If you're religious, read the religious history. Cain and Abel. One brother killed his own 25% DNA. Well, what's the, guy, the athlete that just got killed, the football player that bro dad killed him, brother killed him, basketball player? I mean, this happens a more than you think. Now, spouses, have 0% of your DNA, but because of social means and whenever you create an ally face to face, the social genes go up. So your wife or husband, again, might have, I was with my friend, he's like, man, my wife's parent, kid, parents treat her so bad, I treat her better. I was like, yeah, because you've pushed up this. So here's how the world goes in wealth accumulation, why you must only worry what's in your control. Guess what Lehman Brothers was? If you don't know Lehman Brothers in 2008, they are one, sparked the global recession by going bankrupt. So Lehman Brothers was run by people. Here's you. They're not social allies because they never met you face to face. So when I hear people lamenting that these guys, Lehman Brothers, hurt them, I'm like, when you are playing poker and you don't know who the sucker is, you're the sucker. Wealth is created by face-to-face -face interaction. A lot of wealth is created with, within families because not every mom and dad makes bad choices. You know, a lot of mom and dad do things great for their kids because they have 50% of their DNA. A lot of wealth is created with spouses, and this book talks about that. A lot of wealth is created between Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates.
Steve Ballmer, I was seeing an interview when he bought the Clippers. He said, when I started with Microsoft, there was 30 employees and two million of revenue. When I left as CEO, there was 80 billion of revenue and 100,000 employees. Because he and Bill Gates, but notice, wealth isn't created by the gold market. That's a commoditized market, the coldest of all markets. So stop going back here. Please stop. Just enough already. If you're dreaming and thinking about any of these correlated to your wealth, you are the sucker in the room. All right, so worry, this book says. But I want you to now double down, and I want to do a little exercise here. What is something you haven't been worried about as much as you should that is in your control? Meaning you could do something about it today and change this ratio we talked about in the beginning, net worth. So I'm going to set this for one minute. Something, give something tangible, please. Tangible. So I'm going to set this, mute my microphone, one minute. All right, somebody said financial learning, right, going back to that textbook stuff, that's in your control all the time you've ever thought about. Don't watch the news either, no CNBC, please, unless you are in occasionally looking. Developing new products, good, that creates wealth. Evaluating personal expenses, good. I haven't been worrying about my net worth enough, good. See, you've been, someone's just been focusing on, uh, sometimes just on income. If you, time management, reading more, brokerage accounts, starting my podcast. Yes, starting podcasts can bring you loyal customers. Good bookkeeping, yes. Spend all, you know what you should freak out about? Having a bad accountant because I have had bad bookkeepers. That's something that should keep you up late at night. I will tell you that. And my advice is, Depending on the complexity of your books, have two bookkeepers. I, if you go through the 67 steps, and I talk about it in this business mentorship, this mastery program, uh, you don't want single points of failure. That should be, no one wrote that, but let me, let me write one for you. Be freaked out about this. This is Six Sigma, which is the most advanced planning, I mean most advanced business training program really ever, I mean, GE adopted it. Uh, single, and they talk about this. If you really wanna know what's gonna make you poor and have a nightmare life, right here. If you have one secretary, if you have one accountant, if you have one, if you're a solo entrepreneur, what happens when, by the age of 45, the average person has a 30% chance of having a six month physical disability. That's a single point of failure. Uh, most people, men especially, as they get older, they only have like one friend, one close friend. You need more than one ally. You don't need thousands, but this should keep you up late at night right here. I'll, I'll read you a great quote from this book along that lines here. I thought this was one of the more fun quotes here. It was talking about... Where is this? Got to be careful in books like this, you end up highlighting everything. 
Here we go. <clears throat> it's a quote in the book from an unidentified entrepreneur. What is risk? Having one source of income. Now, I want to, let me say, he, don't take this as having one focused business. That's not what this means. Because people go, oh yeah, Ty, I'm going to open up 10 businesses. That's not what it means. He says, employees are at risk because employees have one source of income. One pink slip on a Friday afternoon and your one source of income, which is a single point of failure. He said, what about the entrepreneur who sells the janitorial services to the company you work for? Now, most of you are entrepreneurs. He says, that entrepreneur has hundreds and hundreds of customers and hundreds and hundreds of sources of income. You know, in the 67 Steps program or in those of you in this, uh, you know, this program, this business mentorship, each of you, if we just take it from a pure logical business standpoint, you would represent one unit of income. If one of you decides you want to travel around the world in a hot air balloon like Jules Verne and you're like, I don't want to be in the program anymore, it's okay. There's lots of people in the programs, thousands and thousands. So single points of failure could be one big customer, one modality. I would advise you not to think this means you should open up 10 different companies. I've made that mistake doesn't mean that. It just means within your one area of focus, don't have all your eggs in one basket. If you look at Hollywood, Dane Cook, the famous comedian, his bro he had one financial advisor who was his brother who stole, what was it? Three million. No, no, more than three. More like 13. Over $10 million from him. His brother's in jail now. Michael Jackson, who had, Michael Jackson had many, what? It was his brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. Dane Cook. Michael Jackson had many problems, probably, it seems like, but one of them was, I think, Jermaine Jackson or something was his financial advisor, which Jermaine Jackson was an entertainer, not a financial advisor. And of course, Michael Jackson basically died bankrupt, or he, he, he was able to save himself barely. He got loans against his Beatles portfolio. But single points of failure. If you have a high net worth, you need to have more than one accountant, in my opinion. More than one bookkeeper. Double checking. So, all right, let's keep going. I'm gonna, so let me, I'm gonna stop for a second. Uh, questions on anything that I've talked about so far. I see things coming in here. We've got a couple hundred comments already on this call. 186, That's good, thank you for interacting. Uh, Use my business cash flows to double down on markets that are, yes, yep. Always double down on what's working. I really think if, I, if today was my last day on the planet and I had to leave one little manual for humanity on what I've learned in business, it's if one thing works and makes you good profit, nice margins, you enjoy doing it, do it 100 times more than you do. Forget double down. That's, I just say that because it's easy to remember. Do you know quintuple down, 1,000th down. Then anything that doesn't work after a certain period of experimentation, you got to test it for a while, but it's like dating. You don't need 10-year horrible marriage to figure out what you already knew after three dates. Just the three dates, that's enough. You're like, ah, we don't get along. It's not easy to do, especially with dating and relationships, because there's a part of our brain, by the way, it's called attachment theory. Heller and Levine, two famous scientists, wrote about this and said, we're built to get attached to people. So uh, one of the sing biggest single points of failure you and I will have in our lives will involve other people, even more than a relationship with, let's say, you know, your bank account or, a, or with one customer. It'll be with, oftentimes, single points of failure are key employees in your business or key advisors. Each of you needs, and this is why this program, remember, it's not about me. If I die today, okay, I hope even from this call, you guys know you don't need me. You got ManQ, economist. He knows way more than, he devoted 40, 50 years. You know, you have, the YouTube videos, you know, go to conferences, get the CFP books, even with knowledge. Don't, some people are, and I'm really calling people out. I am not a guru. I am not an omnipotent, infallible person. I've got a little bit of insight every once in a while. Uh, and I can, I hope that I can help source better information. So 
No single points of learning. If you're a hardcore conservative in your economic policy, be reading, that's giving you a single point of failure because you're going to see every nail, I mean, you're going to see every problem like you have a hammer, but what if it's a screw or a bolt? So single points of failure, let me add that, is in your education. Some of you know a lot about the stock market, but when I ask you about taxes, you don't know anything. So let me just delve real quick into this. This isn't in the book. Then we're going to wrap up here. I could keep talking on this book forever, but I'm not here to entertain. I want This is enough uh, today for me, too. I was telling Brian here, I said, you know, the greatest thing about this business, why I love it, is because when I was reviewing the book notes right before I got on here to do this call, I'm learning. Never be afraid to go back and learn the fundamentals. I've heard of all these things that I talked about. Doesn't mean I'm doing them all. It's not what you know, it's what you do. So single points of failure in your financial arena. These are the five CFP points that each of you must gain mastery over. Each of you do not need to be, I was in the business of financial planning. You don't literally have to take the CFP test. I'm a CFP, CHFC, CLU, all that kind of stuff. It's not important you have those pieces of paper. It's not even important for me anymore because I don't do that. The five is you must know investments, okay? And these are, if you only know this one, you also must know estate planning. You must know how to set up a structure of asset protection and when you die to pass on your wealth to your kids. You must have a, 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 at least a decent level knowledge at this, of this. You got to understand a little bit about wills, a little bit about trusts. It's not that complicated. I can tell you right now what a trust is. It's a non-human entity that can dispose of or buy or sell money or assets. That's it. So you don't always want things in your name. You can either have them in companies or you can have them in trusts. And that's of course is a very elementary. There's very complicated, you know, eyelet trusts and revocable and irrevocable and crummy trusts and all these kind of things. Uh, rabbi uh, trusts and estate planning. But you, you need to know at least the beginning. You need to know a little bit about taxes. Okay? If you know nothing about tax, And a great source of knowledge is for dummies books. Uh, or audiobooks on these. You don't have to listen to this stuff daily, but you can't be a no, uh, you can't not know anything. It's funny, in my business partners, it goes exactly like this. Here, I would say the poorest of my business partners probably has about a $10 million net worth. Okay? Mm, yeah, that's about right. I don't always know everything. And the richest of them, you know, is let's say over a billion, okay? If I have these conversation with this guy, he'll know like one or two of them. As you get up the chain, they know all of them. Every time. I've never met a guy up here at 100 million plus net worth who I'm like, talk about trust, and he's like, well, what's a trust? Never. These people down here, now as you keep going down to zero or negative, most of the world's right around here, these people don't even know what the word estate planning means. Causation, correlation, I don't know, but I do know you might as well pretend that you know these things because eventually pretending becomes real instinct. Taxes, you have to know what we call retirement benefits. And these are generally you know, a more specialized area of basically tax deferred or tax advantage investment. So, in every country in the world, I know we have people in 40 countries here, uh, your government almost always will give you some tax deferred. So investments are somewhat related to these, but in the CFP they break these out. And the fifth thing, column or, or pillar, you must know uh, insurance. Each of you should have life insurance for the most part. If you have dependents or even if you don't, but plan on having dependents. You can buy policies when you're cheap, uh, when you're young and healthy. They're very cheap. Uh, each person should have disability insurance, health insurance, because if you do all four of these right and forget that one, a single accident can take you out. That happened to someone in my family. His wife got a, a Lou Gehrig's disease, the same disease that Stephen Hawking. I remember, my aunt. 
and uh, she died and there was a hole in the health insurance policy where she wasn't covered for the last three months where she racked up an incredible health bill and left my uncle with two little kids under six years old. And my uncle was very successful in income and all these things, but he had, she was scared to get a needle, draw blood for life insurance. So she never got it. So it basically bankrupted him and knocked him off 10 years. You know what would policy? She could have had a $20 a month policy that would have secured that. So it's not all, and this book actually talks about that. I didn't get to that chapter. You can't just grow your money. You also have to protect your money. So single points of failure are found right here. If you're doing this, this, and you're forgetting about tax de deferred programs, you're just giving money to the government that the government doesn't even want. The government sets up ways that you can tax defer stuff or even sometimes get a reduction in your taxable income. If you know all this stuff, but you don't know taxes, remember what that book said? The average low, uh, the average doctor or high earner gives, not, gives has 90% of their income exposed to taxes. If you do all this, but not that, then your money, depending on if you do it wrong, could go to the wrong person. If you do all these, but not investments, you never have growth. So single points of failure. I want you guys to have, so you can buy a book for dummies on investing, buy a book for dummy on insurance. I don't care if you're watching this and you're already a CFP. I, I own about 60 for dummies books. I have for tennis, for, I always find them very enlightening. You just flip through them. And in 10 minutes, you're more knowledgeable than, this is about 6 billion people. In 10 minutes, you've passed all these people. Remember, uh, wealth accumulation is somewhat of a contrast comparative game. Uh, if you read them for one month, you're already up to my partners that are at 10 million net worth. To catch up to these guys, you gotta make it a habit for a few years, you know, 20 years. But you can get to this nice spot up here. Now, I'm not saying just reading books on these is gonna get you 10 million. Go to a tax seminar in your town. Go to a retirement. There's some boring ones. Just go for an hour. Why not? What else are you going to do? I'll tell you what each of us are going to do. We're going to spend the majority of our lives having to earn money. Yet, so people are so uh, nearsighted that they're like, I'm going to work for these five things my whole life but I'll never go to one conference on insurance. I've read a whole, I actually found insurance to be a very fascinating business. The CFP book on insurance really intrigued me. I read it like a, te like a regular book. Um, so I don't think I'm that weird. I think you can learn. One thing I've learned to do, learn how to entertain yourself. Um, Freud talks about this in Civilization and Discontents. You can use the dopamine, remember I was talking about the insight dopamine? This is where insight dopamine is good, to read things that most people wouldn't read. So if you get a high off dopamine, when you read an insurance textbook, which seems the most boring thing ever, you'll get addicted to the dopamine rush of just knowing stuff, and that at least drives you to read. It's not enough if it doesn't become instinct. But So I'm gonna end here with questions. Uh, I'll talk for another 30 seconds here to give you guys time to put in any questions. Okay, someone said, if you've put a question earlier, we coded it so the page wouldn't be too confusing to only show the last 10 comments, so just post it again. Uh, someone looking to wholesale real estate, how do you avoid being a solo entrepreneur and build many streams of income? All right, real estate's easy because most real estate deals are done with business partners, almost all real estate deals. I know of very, every Donald Trump deal, I would say, I don't, I don't know his whole portfolio, but I'd say not, I could easily bet a million bucks that 95%, if not 100% of his deals are done with people. And you're usually doing it with a bank too, so you're almost always doing it. Um, just bought Math for Real Life for Dummies, great. Try to buy a financial book too, because remember this program, 18 months, you're in here. Some of you have been in it for a while, so uh, not 18 months left, but this is focused on wealth accumulation, okay? So get books on math and wealth. How can you increase your net worth when you're starting a business? I mean, should you just focus on growing? Okay, so the way to build a business that will have a net worth, good question, let me touch on that super fast. What are the businesses that have the highest net worth? Some of it's common sense. It's, you know, net profit always is a predictor. 
not the only predictor because some businesses sell for a lot of money with no net profit. Okay, people are looking for growth. And this is a big one in the modern world. People are looking to buy things that have engagement. So WhatsApp was sold with zero revenue, I think. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, Instagram was sold with zero revenue. WhatsApp had a teeny bit of net, uh, no net profit for either of those. Tremendous growth and tremendous engagement. That book hooked, it's a great book to pick up. Talks about why Facebook is addictive. So engagement slash addictive businesses. So if you have a choice in starting a business, go with businesses that people, repeat customers come back as fairly often, if not eight times a day, okay? So that's being, and then um, it's gotta be scalable. So if it's only built around your skill, okay? So for example, this business that you're a part of with me, you've paid money to be in this program, this is not a business I'm doing to build my net worth because it's not scalable that much because if I am get hit by a car and I'm out, I can't do these calls for six months, uh, I'm not here. So it's now over time I'm building this program. You'll see I'm adding in other experts and things to make it more scalable business. Um, now it also needs to be sellable. So some businesses are now that's obvious, but that means there has to be a buyer. So, so biz, I always look, is there enough buyers? Cause you don't just want one buyer because one buyer might be in a bad mood and say, eh, I'll give you a hundred bucks for your business, even though it's worth 10 million because he knows he's the only, it's supply and demand. So these are all the things you wanna look for. Um, if you're just starting out, what Eric Schmidt says in Google is you really wanna, <clears throat> a differentiated product, okay? Something easier, easy to differentiate. And I would add to this real value, you know? It's like the saying, when uh, the tide comes in, you see who's swimming naked. Sometimes businesses, they're not differentiated. They're just the same old, same old. There's no real value there. Okay, other things. How do you find a business partner? So make sure you listen in this program. There's some talks I do on business partners. So I got about an hour long talk on those things I've learned. Proximity to a partnership, a must. You can have long distance partners. Uh, you said Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. They're not that long distance. They own private jets. They visit each other all the time. But it's, it doesn't need to preclude a partnership. But I wouldn't do business with somebody that I would only see once every year. And you need to see each other pretty often. Quarterly, maybe minimum. Which books or topics do you recommend or focus on first? So when I was given those five points here, that's why I said pick up a book like on financial planning for dummies and it should have chapters on all of this, okay? So these are five, you kind of all, here's the good news, you gotta learn lots of stuff. People get really, remember I said don't wor worry about stuff you shouldn't worry about? When it comes to these five very urgent things, these are all important, so just flip a coin. So some people, they, they spend, they'll burn up their glycogen going, what if I read about taxes before insurance? I don't, who cares? They're, they're, they're equally important. Flip a coin. Uh, let's see. Whose seminars would you go to if you were in our shoes? Five points, somebody put? Does that give me five points for answering this? Uh, well, I'm about, go to the ones that I'm doing because you're already in this program. Uh, I would go to all of them though. I mean, I would become at least once a month. So any of them, people are always worried about getting ripped off. Here's the thing, when you go to all of them, you won't get ripped off because if you go to one, let's say you go to four over the next six months, okay? If three of them all agree and one's way off in La La Land, then you just ignore the one that seems like a scam, but you'll never know which one's a scam till you go to lots of them. I go to enough conferences, see this is where most people are in, in fear and scarcity. They're like, but Ty, what if I spend a thousand dollars? Like I saw Donald Trump got sued, he had this online real estate school, and there was this huge thing, like the government came in and uh, 
people were complaining that because he was upselling people into $10,000 and $50,000 programs. I took that program. It was the best damn program. It just shows you how annoying humans can be. It was such a good program. Oh man, I bought one for myself. Then I bought one, Zach, I bought one for Herman for his birthday. It was a couple thousand dollars. Man, I got a hundred grand worth of value. I buy Carlton Sheets, buy Tony Robbins, buy them all. I, I've never found one that didn't give me more value. I went to one, this, what was the one I went to? I went to the one in Con I went to one oh. this Connecticut. Yeah, that w I'm not sure I would go again just because now I get a lot of options, but when I was starting out, it still was worth going. But what I'm trying to say is even that conference that I didn't love, it was totally worth it mathematically. Because at least even though I like the conference, you get to meet like-minded people. Go to them all. Abundance mentality. Abundant People go, I'm in scarcity, Ty. I can only learn this. That's I call BS on that. The human brain is more powerful than any supercomputer. Uh, is there any way I can still see the Donald Trump thing you mentioned? Yeah, I think it's still... I don't know if the government made him take... I can't believe that one got... I was so mad about that. I was like, that one's awesome. So good. I'll tell you, I told this story before. I went on a, I was one of the first people in Donald Trump's thing because I was in an abundance. See, what happened is in 2001, I bought an online course from Corey Rudel and it made me like 100 grand and I paid 500 bucks for it. So I have the best taste in my mouth for spending money on knowledge. Like, I'm the, if people are coming to me out of scarcity and want to convince me about scams, I'm like, uh, I call BS on that. I've taken everyone, even the ones people call scam, and I always get value. So I bought this Donald Trump one right when it came out. Now it went up in price, but back then it was like a grand, which was still a lot of money for me. This is like an 03 or something for. And you know, a grand was a decent amount of money and nobody was even saying to do this online stuff. I was you know, putting, going, okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and buy online education. So I go on the first live webinar they have and it was such a new program. Donald Trump had enlisted the number one PhD in the world on real estate. So I get on the call and nobody's on the call except me and him. And he talks for an hour and it's crazy. I wish I, I, wish I had more money when I read it because he said, Ty, because I said, it's just me and him talking on the phone. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I was living in San Diego. And he's like, oh man, I wrote a PhD thesis or something on what land you, sh what real estate you should buy in San Diego. And I was, I, so I said, Oh, what should I buy? And he goes, buy in Claremont. So I, believe it or not, I went to junior high in Claremont. So I knew it really well. And he, I said, why? He said, well, La Jolla is priced much higher because it's on the beach. But I did the math and I ran an algorithm and I live in New York and I found the places that are undervalued in the United States and it's Claremont. So um, he says it's only 10 minutes from La Jolla. And I knew that's true. The 52, it's a little freeway. You're there in 10 minutes. So I didn't have the money back then to do it. And um, I've watched Claremont. Man, that dude was right. If I had bought, my friend bought a house for like 80 grand or something, it's worth like $600,000 now. I was like, damn it. And you could leverage money. So 800 grand, 80 grand houses, you could have put, back then you could maybe put 10 to 20% down. So you'd put 16,000 down, rent it out pretty much for equal what the mortgage is. I could have bought, if I could have found, some backer, of course I didn't have this program, didn't know all the persuasion stuff then, I'd been able to buy 10 houses, just think of this, if I'd bought 10 houses, that would have required a bat, someone to, someone who could sign for the loan. I've got, now now it's not as hard, I could do it myself or bring in a syndicate, but that would have been about $160,000 down, okay? Let's say each place I'd have put 16 grand down and maybe some money to float the vacancies and the tax, I mean the credit partner. So I own 10 houses, I don't $5 million net worth from that, just that little, I mean, and tax deferred growth. Remember, real estate grows, it's not realized gains. It's only realized when you sell it. And some of them you never have to sell. Here's the crazy thing about real estate. The only thing I like about real estate, I'm not a big real estate guy. So if it accumulate, if I put in, bought eight houses, uh, 10 houses, for uh, 80 grand, I'd have 800,000 in it. It appreciates, let's say 500 or 600. So I got a 5 million net, okay? You normally, if you make $5 million realized income, 
you got to pay either ordinary income or depending on the asset, uh, shorter long-term capital gains. But with real estate, you could take an equity line against it, which means not only do you not pay taxes on the money pulled out, but you get a tax deduction on the interest you paid. It's crazy. I'm like, damn it. So that all goes back to everybody in the world's in scarcity. Should I take it? Take every class you can afford. Really. I, people think I'm trying to sell something. I do this. So when I offer lots of up, you notice that I always offer upgrades. It's because I want to know who's really interested. I'm not going to price all my stuff the same. It's not fair. And I didn't expect people to do it too. So buy stuff. I have other programs. Not all of you are in the persuasion program. On the way over here, Zach and Maya, we were in the, we're staying at a nice hotel in London and we had a driver drive us over. And I've been showing Zach this persuasion system, uh, this personality system. And it's so accurate that I'm like, I got to write a book. It's more powerful than anything I've ever, and I was just showing how you can predict that the driver, I was like, this guy's an S, which is social. And I just start, Maya started recording it because I could, this guy, I know exactly who he is, everything about him. He was like, ah, how do you know so much about me? Yesterday, I was out. Who were we out with yesterday? Oh, remember? We're at that sushi dinner. And I said, you don't like to apologize, Zach. Yeah, yeah, and this nice. girl's like, how do you know that about me? I've never apologized in my whole life. I was like, because I have a personality persuasion system. So people come in this program, they make an extra 100 grand, and then they don't buy all the programs I have. Look, I'm not trying to sell you this, but if it works, double down. Think. So anyway, long answer. People to find some. Ty, in your 67 steps, you mentioned making business a marketplace versus a service business. As an RI, I'm thinking of bundling up my business process as a package to market it. Yeah, that's a great one. Well, uh, so Patrick, to answer that, the definition of a marketplace would be if you built a website where people could buy RIA businesses you be like a middleman broker. So that's one way. So you could think about something like that. You could help people find deals, um, RIAs, Registered Investment Advisory Firms that wanna buy other firms and you could just have the premier centralized location. I don't think there's a website like that. And then you could have one or two employees that source, that go do due diligence and you put like little star ratings on it and in exchange, so the RIAs for sale would pay I don't know, a thousand bucks a month to be on your website. And then the uh, buyers could maybe have to pay to get access to the list. Plus you could take a percentage of every deal. Maybe you could take 10% or something as like a business broker. So that would be an example of the net of doing the marketplace. What you're talking about would be more of an example of building an education business, which is a B2C business, which I like too. I like those two. Okay, two more and we're gonna go. Where do you sign up for the persuasion system? Any of you want to know that, email Maya at Ty Lopez. Remember, it's not my cheapest system. So for those of you just starting out, you're gonna to have to graduate. That's my persuasion thing will make you a lot of money. So I, I basically price things one tenth of I think the money it'll make you. If I think it'll make somebody a hundred grand, I'll charge 10 grand. If I think it'll make them 10 million, I charge a million. That's why I have a million dollar thing because some people I help make 10 million. That's my pricing mode. Different people have different ones. But if you want to know about the persuasion one, you, or any of the programs that maybe you don't have. Okay, Maya Tyler. Quick question. I'm in your green belt persuasion. Okay. So when are you going to do a video on cognitive biases? So I'm, I will be recording a lot of new ones. That one, the, the persuasion program, is a program I'm going to add a lot of content continually. Um, we're just working on trademarking the actual uh, whole pay system. So yes, keep watching for that. Now remember though with the persuasion system, what I give you, you got to go out and practice it. So every waiter you meet, people meet me and they're like, you're almost psychic. I'm like, it's not because I'm special, but I got at least 10 to 20,000 hours into reading people. I can read people very fast. Um, it's probably almost my best skill in all of life. Uh, I don't know that many people that are, can read people faster than me, really. And it's not because I'm special, but I don't know anybody who spent more hours doing it. I did it out of sales, and uh, now I do it just out of once you've 
done something created interest. So uh, I know business and life pract best practices are use your strengths and focus on your journey. What was your focus? Yeah, so I've been involved in many things. ENTPs, that's my personality type. We often test many things. Uh, I look at many experiments. Everything I learned, I could have learned 10 years quicker. So I probably wasted a decade. So you don't have to do everything that I do. <clears throat> if I could go back, start over, I would become a master at persuading and reading myself first. And then I would pick one thing and I would go crazy with it and stick to it for at least 10 years and make a lot of money. And then I would do all the other stuff uh, later after I mastered one thing. Let's see. Okay. Go down a little bit. Someone wrote, there's a, there's a book called A Little Bit of Everything for Dummies. Okay. Have I done any training on online launches, businesses specifically? And my thoughts about ClickBank. Uh, have you worked with Josh Pelliser? Yes. Yes. I was the, his business mentor. Still am. So I know Josh well. Uh, good guy. Great guy. Online launches, yep, I've done lots of them. I was one of the first people to do them, so I know them really well. Back in 01, I was doing it before. Really, there was a handful of guys before me that I learned from. So I'm gonna put out some specific internet-based stuff. Right now, though, focus on this. All the fundamentals you're learning here will be applicable to any type of business, even business, uh, uh, even an online business or offline business, okay? Now, let me assign the next book let me write it on here. Okay. The next book for everybody is called, this is a great one, classic, The Intelligent Investor. It's the best my handwriting will ever be by one of the greats of all time, Benjamin Graham. Now, it's not the smallest, he's not the easiest person you've ever read. I just want you to get three points. Two weeks from now, three things you learn from this book, okay? Three things. You're not going to, this is, this guy, Benjamin Graham, you could spend, you know, Warren Buffett's 84. He still follows and reads this guy, so, and he started at seven, so he has 77 years into studying this guy. Start with this. If you've read this book before, great. Every great book, we make it our friend and we read it. You don't go to dinner one time with your friend, right? You don't go one time to dinner with people you don't like. If you've read this book before, then it's time to go to dinner again with it. And again, and again, and again. This is one, buy a hard copy. I would buy it, if you can afford it, buy a hardback. And uh, get it on audio and get it on your phone. Double down. Better to have 150 books. And people always ask me, this, once again, I'm going to end by this. Scarcity versus abundance mentality. People say they really fixate. You know, it's hilarious. People could ask me a lot of questions, right? I talk on different subjects. I could maybe give them insight on a myriad of complicated things. You know one of the most common questions I get? This shows you what's wrong with the human brain. It's called the misweighting bias. They ask me, should I buy this book in audio or physical? I stopped answering that question. It's too stupid. I don't want to just dignify. Now, I'm not looking down on people because I make stupid mistakes like that, but don't ever be that guy, especially on this program. This is the advanced program. I'm not going to graduate. By the way, I reserve the right to not graduate anybody. You can be in this program 18 years. If you are still going to embarrass my name by being like, hey, I graduated from Ty's program and I don't know anything, I will not graduate you. I'm going to test everybody, by the way, smart or beginner. And one of the things, if you're asking me a question, now I'm, I'm not talking about this person, but it just reminded me. Everybody here should be abundant. So your better question should be like, where is the best place to buy the audio, the physical, get the YouTube video of Benjamin Graham, go to a Benjamin, like do it all. Audio books are 10 bucks, and the physical book, if you buy it used, is five bucks. If you're not willing to spend $15 twice a month, you have, you ain't not going anywhere in wealth accumulation. You will plateau. Abundance. The number one question for me should never be, Ty, should I go to the Donald Trump conference? You know what my answer is, yes. 
And if you go, but Ty, I'm already doing the 67 steps. Well, then you're in scarcity. You got plenty of time, plenty. Anybody who thinks they don't have enough time, go read James Franco's Wikipedia. Let me end with this. I know I keep saying, I love this. I love this Wikipedia. Because I know, I mean, he's in, I don't know him personally, but uh, he's in my circle of friends. I'm not close friends with him, but he's in my circle in Hollywood. So he's born in 78, so he's 36. His occupation, actor, writer, producer, director, teacher. That's a pretty good one. His first role was in a television program, Freaks and Geeks. He later played James Dean and he won a Golden Globe. Then he was Harry Osborn in the Spider-Man trilogy. Then he was in Flyboys, Pineapple Express, Milk, 127 Hours, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Oz, The Great Powers, or Spring Breakers, This is the End, and The Interview. He also had a recurring role in General Hospital. He's also nominated for an Academy Award. He also volunteers for the Art of Elysium charity and teaches at U New York University in feature filmmaking and production. He also has a short course film that he teaches at UCLA. He also has a course he teaches at USC. And he's also getting a PhD from Yale. Where is that one? It's cr He's in abundance. He did three movies in one year. He shot. It's cr education. He, d he was dissatisfied with his career's direction, re-enrolled in UCLA at autumn 2006 as an a English major. He received permission to take 62 course credits per quarter compared to the normal limit of 19. 62. While he's shooting movies, while still continuing to act, receiving rem many of his credits from independent study for his involvement. So he's, he was studying while he was on the set of Spider-Man 3. Then he graduated with a GPA of 4.0. Then he studied French, the Holocaust, the philosophy of science, American literature while on set. Then, where's his PhD thing? He moved to New York to simultaneously attend graduate school at Columbia's University MFA writing program and New York University Tisch School of the Arts for filmmaking and Brooklyn College for fiction writing while also attending, attending the low residency MFA program for writers at North Carolina Warren Wilson. And he received an MFA from Columbia and he's now a PhD student in English at Yale while attending the Rhode Island School of Design. That's a man living life. Remember the thing, the philosopher, I think Thoreau? Suck the marrow out of life? Who do you think sucking the marrow out of life? Somebody asking me if they should get the audio version of this or the physical? This man is getting four degrees. He's getting a Yale. A Yale PhD is not easy. And he's, you saw this movie. He's just out an interview. Abundance. Who would you rather be? James Franco or the people on that grid down here? All lost, all talking about gold in the recession all emailing me about, is it audio? Sh Ty, I'm afraid to put my credit card in because what if it gets stolen? I'm like, what world are you in, man? You can just call your bank and get the money back. What scarcity fear are you living in? And I know the answer, it's the medieval mind. Medieval or earlier. Nobody have a medieval mind. I will not graduate anybody here. I will tell you this, if you listen to me, and you really make this stuff instinctual, I will turn you into, not because of me, into a machine, just like that movie 300. A dream fulfillment machine, whatever your dreams are, just like James Franco. That's a real man. And there's women in here, be a real woman. Suck the marrow out of life. Like the ancient proverb says, it's been given to man to have 70 or so years. Maybe we live a little longer. Live. As Seneca said, most people don't live, they just pass time. Go through this, suck the marrow out of that book while you're getting your PhD at Yale and doing my 67 step program and working out at the gym. What else are you gonna do? Watch TV, play video games? All right, so this book, two weeks, keep going through the program, get into the vault, download them, walk around with them, Listen every day, make it a habit. 
Go create wealth for yourself and your family and change the world, okay? Talk to you guys soon.